Are we living inside of a simulation? Are we living inside of a simulation? We are almost certainly living in a simulation. The odds that we're in base reality is one in billions. I'm waiting for someone to convince me that we don't live in a simulation. Uh, what's what's on the other side? What's outside the yeah. simulation? I want you to imagine this. You get to the end of your life, you kick the bucket, and then it's all over. But then something happens. You wake up again, and you're not in heaven or hell or any other form of afterlife. You're actually in your bedroom in the year 2342, and you're not the age you were when you passed. You're actually 16, and you just finished an immersive game in the primitive and exciting world of the 21st century. But how could that be? If none of this was really real, you'd think we'd be able to tell, right? right. right? When you first hear it, the idea that we actually live inside some sort of artificial digital universe seems pretty silly, like something some tech bro from Silicon Valley came up with after he did ayahuasca in the jungle. But some of the smartest people in the world actually take it pretty seriously, and a number of tech billionaires have spent millions of dollars trying to prove we live in a simulation and help break us out of it. Even a NASA scientist said that, quite frankly, if we are not living in a simulation, it is an extraordinarily unlikely circumstance. So today we are going to answer some of the most asked questions related to the simulation argument, like where did this idea come from, how it could actually be possible, some of the evidence that proves we might actually be living in one, and what might be the scariest question of them all, why would someone or something do this to us? We are living in a computer programmed reality and the only clue we have to it is when some variable is changed. The simulation theory suggests that everything we perceive to be real, like our lives, our planet, and our universe, is actually a computer-generated program or video game. If you've seen The Matrix, it's exactly like that, except there's no red or blue pill to help get you out of it. Now, you're probably thinking, this all seems pretty real, there's just no way. But there is, in fact, actually a way. You see, the first video game ever created was in 1958, and all it was was a very simple game of tennis with a ball bouncing back and forth. Only 64 years later, we have video game graphics that look like this, that can be played completely in virtual reality, and we're seeing more and more devices created to help us actually feel the game that we're playing. If you think about what this technology might look like in 50, or 100, or 150 years, it seems incredibly likely that virtual reality will be indistinguishable from true reality. Now you might be thinking, there's no way anyone would spend their time creating a video game just to simulate everyday life. And I would like to remind you that The Sims, which is short for simulation by the way, has sold over 200 million copies worldwide. You might just be one of the characters in Sims version 69. The idea that everything we perceive to be real is in fact an illusion has been around since at least the 17th century from famous philosopher René Descartes. More on him later. The Matrix came out in 1999 and the whole plot was built around this idea. But the actual widespread belief that we might in fact be living inside a computer simulation didn't start gaining popularity until this guy, Nick Bostrom, released his essay in 2003 called Are You Living in a Computer Simulation? where he presented the simulation trilemma. Now, if you're like me and you don't know what what a trilemma is. It's just like a dilemma, except it's three bad options. Now, here's where things get a little bit spooky. Nick Bostrom says that one of these three things has to be true. Every and any technologically advanced civilization in our universe will get wiped out in an apocalyptic event before they reach this level of technology. Seeing as you could probably argue we're less than 100 years away from being able to achieve this, that would mean yes, we are headed straight towards annihilation we become technologically advanced enough in the future to simulate reality, but we all collectively choose not to, which seems pretty unlikely because A, again, I ask you to refer to The Sims, and B, as Simon Whistler puts it, Civilization sort of has a f around and find out attitude when it comes to, you know, pretty much any scientific advancement. If one day we survive long enough and become technologically advanced enough to simulate reality, it all but guarantees we are already living in a simulated world, and then you have simulations all the way down. 
But hold on a second. How does creating a simulation in the future mean that we are probably already in a simulation now? I want you to take a look at this Russian doll. This one right here is base reality. And base reality advances far enough in the future to have the technology to simulate a new one and actually does so. So now you have base reality and the first level of the simulation. If you leave the simulation long enough with conscious inhabitants who have free will, eventually one of them will create a computer and a video game and one day they too will create a simulation and so on and so forth all the way down. So assuming that argument three is correct, we are either first or we are last. Which is why you'll hear people say that the odds we live in a simulation are about 50. Oops. Which is why you'll usually hear people say that the odds we live in a simulation are about 50, oh, 50, 50. Which is why you'll hear people saying that the odds we live in a simulation are about 50, 50. But they're actually a lot higher than that because there is one real physical world, but there is an infinite amount of potential simulated worlds with simulated people who have created more simulated worlds, which means mathematically speaking, the odds you find yourself in the one true physical world are almost zero. Now that's fun and everything, but is there any proof that the reality we perceive to be real could actually be a simulation? Well, no, it's impossible to prove that we are living in a simulation, but it's also impossible to prove that we aren't living in a simulation. So let's take a look at some of the evidence. If you've spent any time on a computer program, like ever, you know that they all have two things in common. Every single one has rules and parameters that it has to follow, and every computer program at one point or the other experiences some form of glitch. Which is why one of the most common pieces of evidence in the simulation debate is the Mandela Effect, a really strange phenomenon where a large portion of the population misremembers something from the past to be different from what actually happened. Like how Nelson Mandela didn't die in prison in the 1980s, or how Jiffy Peanut Butter never existed, Monopoly Man never had a monocle, and what might be the weirdest one for me, how Fruit of the Loom never had a cornucopia in its logo. Max Tegmark, a cosmologist at MIT, said that the strict laws that govern our universe are also proof that we are living inside a simulation. And some of these laws, including the speed of light, could be parameters set by the creators to limit the speed for transmitting information within the network. It could also be the solution to the Fermi paradox. There are billions and trillions of planets in our universe, and mathematics Mathematically speaking, the universe should be beaming with intelligent life, but we see nothing and we hear nothing. If we are living inside a program that's whole purpose is to simulate Earth and life on Earth, it would make sense that we are by ourselves. But the universe is huge. Realistically, would it even be possible for the most advanced technology or biggest computer you could ever imagine to simulate something so incredibly massive and complicated? Well, the answer is no. And as Dr. Kaku puts it, No computer can build a universe capable of simulating the entire universe, except the universe itself. But what if, and hear me out, you wouldn't need to. You see, there are two options here. If you've ever played a video game, you know that the only part of the map that's rendered is the area where you are as the player. As you move through it, the system is only focused on ensuring that where you are is completely rendered, not the entire map. If we are living inside a simulation, and this simulation did come from advancements we made over time with video games and virtual reality, it's safe to assume the simulation would function the exact same way. Which means that the answer to the famous question, if a tree falls in the woods and no one is around to hear it, does it really make a sound? is no, it does not. The entire universe is not being rendered at all times, only the parts of it that the players can participate in. So when we look up at the stars and the galaxies that we see in the night sky, they're not actually there. They're merely projections painted on a digital wall. Option number two is that you are the only real thing in the entire universe. You see, everything that you experience is just a result of electrical activity happening in your brain. Your senses are responding to external stimuli and your brain is making sense of it all for you. Theoretically, it would be completely possible to manipulate that activity, causing you to experience something else entirely, and you wouldn't be able to distinguish it from your true reality, which would mean that it's not an entirely simulated universe, but an illusion created just for you. If that's the case, it's less likely that you're living inside some computer program, and more likely that your physical body is strapped into some machine somewhere, manipulating your perceived reality. Now, let's say, hypothetically, that all of this is in fact a simulation. The real question would be why? Why would someone, or something, build all of this? Well, one of the most likely answers is that we are part of what is called a massive modeling exercise. And what is an MME exactly? 
A massive modeling exercise is a computer program or simulation designed to find the optimal way of achieving a specific goal. What that specific goal or purpose is, is impossible to say, but if we are here to help some higher up life form solve a problem, the clues to what this problem is would be found in the biggest challenges that we are facing right now. Some of the most glaring ones are climate change. How did the humans of our time either beat or fall victim to the changing climate? And what lessons could be applied to any future civilizations also facing some form of energy crisis or self-destruction? With the rapid advancements we've seen in AI over the past year, it's becoming more and more likely that we are approaching the technological singularity, a moment in time where we create a super powerful AI that surpasses human intelligence and control. And maybe it's the super AI itself, simulating the world it came from before it was born, leading all the way up to its creation. If we are able to completely stop the human aging process, which I do have another video on by the way, that would mean that humans are amortal. We could never die from old age or an illness, but we could still die from a physical injury. The safest way to protect the body while still being able to live life would be to place the amortal humans into simulations where they could live out an endless amount of different lives while still protecting their bodies. They could choose to play life as a king in ancient Rome or an actress in the 1900s or as a regular person in the 21st century. Now, I've talked about simulation theory a couple of times on here and on my TikTok account, and one of the most common messages and comments that I get from you guys is that it can be a little bit scary if you think about it too much, which is funny because the whole point of this idea when it was first presented by Descartes in the 17th century was exactly that. The consequence of this line of thinking is that we can't trust our senses, that the reality we perceive may be an illusion created by some supreme being intended to deceive us. But if there is someone or something who is trying to deceive us, then we clearly exist. The illusion, he says, can never bring it about that I am nothing, so long as I think that I am something. Which is where his famous saying comes from, I think, therefore I am. The ability alone to doubt the existence of one's reality means that one is thinking. And for thinking to happen, there must be someone doing the thinking. So at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter if the reality we perceive to be real is a simulation or not, because the real gift is that we can perceive anything at all. We will probably never know the real reason as to why we're here, but we're here, so we might as well make the most out of it while we can, before the simulation gets turned off.